seconds. It's happening. Yeah, man, you bored yet? Not feeling yet. Feeling heavier bored this week. Uh, both feeling terribly bored. Feeling a little bored, mostly heavy. It's been a pretty heavy one. You nervous? Nervous as shit, dude. You ever known me not to be? Yeah, I guess that's true. Yeah, man. All right. Well, this is the first episode of Heavy Board. My name's Andrew Whitstat. And I am bored. <laughs> I'm Sophie Wiener. <laughs> yeah, there it is. And this is the first episode, so welcome. Uh, today we're talking about The House of Mirth, the classic novel by Edith Wharton. I guess we have two different versions of this. I read the Penguin version. Yeah, man, I got that Dover Thrift. Dover four bucks. Thrift, four bucks. I think the, the Penguin Classics was seven. We'll link both in the description of the podcast here uh, for those that want to uh, participate and read along to some extent. Does anybody read along on podcasts? I don't think so. Yeah, I don't, I don't think, think so. that's a real thing. I think we're just pretending to have a book club. And saying like read along, but I don't think any. I think this is where you come when you haven't read House of Mirth and you need to know what happened. You need to know about the very fuckable Lawrence Selden. The fuckable Lawrence Selden. I don't even know what happened, and I just read the book twice. All right. Well, what else going on? Nothing. What are you drinking, Soph? Anything? Um, some like basic bitch white wine that I'm sure was very cheap. I don't even know what it is. Good, good. We like the basic bitch. It's just in my fridge. The basic bitch. Basic bitch alcohol. Who reads books? No one. No one. I guess if you read books, subscribe to this podcast. Yeah. Do you like to read? Do you like to pretend that you read? (laughs) <laughs> this podcast is for you. Yeah, the latter one's more important. Yeah, that's really where it matters. So, do you want the appearance of being a red person? Well, so do we. Uh, well, I guess let's do thoughts. What did you think, Soph? I mean, fucking House of Mirth. Listen, you know, I feel like there's a there's a middle part that I get kind of bored at. I know you don't, but overall... Man, this book fucks me up. Yeah, I mean, it's dense. I mean, all of Wharton's stuff is dense. I expect Sophie to go into some type of sentence rant about it eventually. I mean, the uh, sentences are phenomenal. Right, that's what I mean. Like, But they are, they are kind of extremely, extremely dense, but that's more her style than anything else. Yeah, I mean, if we're just being honest, I mean... Yeah, I mean, this book blew me away. I mean, all her books kind of blew me away. Um, so I guess I should clarify that for listeners that I'm a pretty big, um, pretty obsessed with Edith Wharton. I think Edith Wharton's one of the best American writers to ever live. I guess that's not really a controversial thing to say. I mean, I don't think it is at this point. Yeah. She's one of the most famous authors that I had never read until a year ago. Right. And so I was brought here by shame. (laughs) Um, It's really shame that has really launched my career as a reader. But yeah, her, I mean, her endings blow me away every time. And sort of her, I mean, I feel like it's like dumb to say this, but her sort of game of wits dialogue is really fucking fun. Yeah, the game of wits is, I mean, it's essentially the entire plot is the game of wits. It's, I kept, I guess this will come up as we talk about it, but I kept wanting to compare it to, uh, yeah, I mean, something like Game of Thrones, or obviously not like the genre style of it, but just like the idea that the most of the plot is like people screwing each other over not actually screwing yeah each other, but no, there's really a, a true lack of sex <laughs> a lack of, yeah 
But not even know. that, just like, yeah, the game of wits aspect is more... We'll get into that. But yeah, basically we both love this book. There were parts that maybe stretch a little too long. I mean, it is, it is. there are parts that are dated, right? I mean, if this was originally published in 1905, uh, of course it's dated. I mean, there are going to be parts that we just look at as like, oh, that's silly. Yeah, I mean, well, I think that one of the dangers of maybe, a danger, again, maybe a stupid word to use here, but of sort of talking about this book in this format, I think, um, is that it is really dependent on, uh, well, so obviously it's a lot about high New York society at the turn of the century. And I don't want I think, you know, you sort of said this too, you don't want to fall into the trap of just looking at it through the lens of wealthy versus poor. Oh, yeah. I was bitching to Sophie about that before this via text message about the scholarship around it and how it is kind of this kind of class. Class analysis seems to permeate all of the actual scholarship around the book, but... Um... Yeah, which I think it does a disservice to the tragedy that we just read. Like, I think this is such a tragedy on, like, a Shakespearean level. Uh, that the class analysis always is going to fall short. Just because it only does analyze class. Like, that's all it analyzes. Yeah, I mean, I guess we should talk about what the book's about. Other than, you know, so it's New York High Society. We're looking at Lily Bart. Lily Fart. Right, she's our Lily Fart. She's our main character. House of Farts. Yeah, I guess we'll we'll just do a quick synopsis. I mean, yeah, so she's basically Lily's her parents die. She's been trained to uh cement herself into the top one percent, so to speak, and then the entire story is just the chain of events of her trying to cement herself into this top 1%. So when you think of the storyline itself is very, very simple. I mean, it's not like an overly complex story. Uh, most of the, uh, the drama occurs with gossip in between uh, characters, not necessarily like any serious events, although there are events. I don't know. I kept thinking of Gatsby when, we were, when I was reading this. I mean, that makes sense. Yeah, and well, I guess I, say that I haven't actually read Gatsby. Again, shame. Shame is what brought me here. Yeah, you haven't had to, you haven't had to read Gatsby. Nope. Damn, dude, I had to read Gatsby like four times. Like two Sorry in high. Sorry to hear that. Yeah, like two. I mean, I like it. Like two in high school. But yeah, Fitzgerald famously loved Wharton's work. He would talk. He would always. I mean, how can you not love her work? But I'm sure he was a, a big fan of this. But yeah, basically Gatsby in the sense that we're talking about the the elite, the elite of the elite. So we're talking like top 1% of 1% in like New York City, turn of the century. So I mean, you know, Gatsby famously wrote about that. Or I mean, Fitzgerald famously wrote about that. And Gat, pretty much all his books. I mean, same with Wharton, pretty much all her same books. Same with Wharton, yeah. yeah. So and I guess the big thing and also something that I think is a common theme in at least maybe the three big, big ones that I've read um, are centered a lot around marriage. Wharton's? Yeah. Yeah. So we, Lily Bart needs to find a man to marry to secure her place in high society. Yeah, well, you brought up themes. I mean, that's a good place to go with this. I think we want to talk about themes. I wrote a bunch down as I was reading through here. So there's the couple, uh, beauty, wealth. Yeah, we should say that too, that Lily Bart, one of the biggest points about her is that she is extraordinarily beautiful. Yeah, like breathtakingly so. And everybody that knows her, and everybody knows it, like, including Lily. But yeah, alright, so beauty's a big theme, I have wealth, I have pride. Ugh. 
Just had a lot of coffee. Uh, I have marriage versus love. Oh man, that indigestion. Yeah, that's right. It's coming up from down below. Uh, Regular George Dorset. <laughs> Uh, and then along with beauty, I have like sub themes that I noticed. So like the power of beauty, uh, aging, uh, clearly this is, there's a lot of materialism in this, um, specifically with jewels and dresses, uh, you know, literally excesses, materialist excesses, uh, mm -hmm. sexism, uh, we can touch on that if we want to, but you know, just as much as everybody understands. I mean, like, this book was written at a time when it was very... The world was very fucking sexist, so... Uh, yeah, there's that. I don't know how interesting that could be. So, like, I mean, most of, the, most of what could be said about that has been said. Uh, and then I also had the theme of sacrifice. I thought that came up a lot. And then, like, this idea of being a victim of the environment that you're in. Yeah, uh, that's a big one. If we can call, I mean, you know, hard, I guess it seems strange to call people this wealthy victims, but I mean, you could call it, you could make an argument that she's, Lily's a victim as well as everybody, every other character, basically. A victim. Well, I would argue that's a lot of the, um, if this book had an argument, that would be a big part of it, that everyone is sort of, to some degree, a victim of their circumstance and their their environment. Yeah, I mean, the wealthy are going to do wealthy things. But let us I guess let's touch on beauty first, and like the power of beauty and how important it is to this, especially when, you know, when we're introduced to her, the first thing we're, we're shown is Selden and her together. As if he said, the fuckable Selden. The very fuckable Warrant Selden. He's well, he there. does seem pretty fuckable, like, for most of the book. Yeah. And he doesn't appear that much in it. He doesn't really, and and his perspective, and I guess we're basically getting a third person omniscient, although not quite. I guess it varies, but we mostly get Lily's perspective. But uh, when we do get other characters, it's usually through. Like I almost, I kept, I almost had to stop myself of thinking that. Uh, uh, that Lily Bart was the narrator because she's not. Although we do, we are inside her head quite often. But she's not. Yeah, I know. I guess there is a separate narrator, kind of a third person on um, just you know omniscient, basic stuff. But yeah, I mean the idea of beauty, like the first thing we notice when we first meet her. I mean, you know, she's worried about lines in her face, like she's worried about wrinkly. She's 28, unmarried. Uh, I know that's that's almost like a cliche now, right? Like the sexist cliche of being like, oh, you're 28 and unmarried. You know, you'll be an old maid. But I guess in 1905, I mean, in the top 1%, I mean, that, that, was, that was fucking serious. That was a big deal. Uh, I guess she isn't technically even like top 1% really. Like she's kind of poor. Well, she herself is. But like, I just mean like in terms of the world we're looking yeah. at. It's just the people trying to cement themselves into, like, you think about all the characters. Uh, it's all about the wealth and then, like, everything that that brings. So the security, uh, the fine garments, etc., etc. The superiority, which I think is, is not talked about very honestly. Um, how we associate wealth with superiority. Yeah, uh, that's a big theme. I th I think that's another one of those things that leads people to call this a black comedy is is this idea that these these uber wealthy people um gain a sense of superiority from you know us peasants essentially because their their vast wealth uh, I mean however you want to think about it whatever type of value judgment you want to place on it they do view them like there is like a level of like well I can do this and you can't I mean. Yeah, well, I mean, the first thing that we come up on is, like, Lawrence Selden is surprised to see her, um, her desultory air perplexes him. She always has this air of, like, not being bothered or not caring or just things are happening to her. Right, carelessness. Um... I don't want to say Kardashian, but I'm going to say Kardashian. I mean, <laughs> she's a little Kardashian, dude. Yeah. 
Well, uh, yeah, all of the things that she has to do are sort of things of that she would sort of define as of the feminine art. The feminine art. It's, all, is... it's always about how slenderly she can hold her body, you know, <laughs> or which way the the curves of her body, you know, align to her background. Yeah, that's a good point because there is a lot of there is a lot of talk to the narration at least uh and what lily thinks about too through the gender or like the sex rather of uh of like she's like there's a lot of reference to like uh what does wharton say like you know which is like the natural state of her sex or something like yeah like just like uh so i don't know i mean yeah the idea of men and women uh but particularly this uh, again keep in mind this 1905 era uh where i mean beauty still is i would say a very big commodity i mean who are we kidding here probably I mean, beauty even... but also just generally oh god damn it okay. but also just generally appearances oh don't get me started on appearances dude appearances matter so much well everything is about appearances here yeah that's i mean true. even in that first page like there was nothing new about lily bart yet he could never see her without a faint movement of interest it was characteristic of her that she always roused speculation that her simplest act seemed the result of far-reaching intentions far-reaching intentions and there's Wharton again just laying it out beautifully. Far-reaching intentions. But yeah, I mean, there is that level. Like, everybody is hypnotized by Lily Bart's beauty in this book. Every character, even the female characters, are mentioning it, thinking about it, referring to it in conversation with her. Uh, it's it. This woman has been told... I mean, obviously, she's. we're meant to think as readers she's be more beautiful than everybody else in the room no matter what room she goes into and everybody knows it and it's just kind of like i mean you know dealing with that fact so this person is 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 been told how much prettier she is i.e how much better she is than like everybody else if we're going to equate beauty with uh some type of of commodity which it is i mean would it would it <clears throat> that would be an interesting thing to like the privilege of beauty. Well, it is. That's so when she is being sort of courted by Rosedale, I mean, he makes it sort of a frank business arrangement. You're the most beautiful woman. I mean, to have you. And there's like no real love proposition. It's like a collector and he's collecting. Yeah. And this is sort of the trend of her whole story is that she has endless opportunities for a marriage, but um, they are absent of love. God. Oh. And which she doesn't define it as through most of the novel. So, like, we come to learn that through her relationship with Selden. Um, God, right, yeah. there's that moment when they're at Bellamont and she is uh, sort of pursuing the very unfuckable Percy Grice. <laughs> yeah, that's that's. I remember texting you reading that scene about like uh, when she gets on the train and sees him and she has to not smoke because he doesn't like smoking. So like, and then the girl, the other, the friend comes up. She's like, "Oh, do you have a cigarette on you?" She's like, "I don't, I don't smoke." But... <laughs> yeah, it's petty dumb shit like yeah. that. But also, you know, even just the sense like, oh, she she has this thought of, oh, well, maybe this is like the first trip he has ever taken in the presence of a beautiful woman. And just by his mannerisms, you know it is. Yeah, he he is, Percy Grace is like the super awkward rich youtuber maybe like because he and he's rich not because of his youtube channel but like because he inherited and right. now he just has a youtube channel <laughs> and thinks of himself like good at picking up women but isn't are we talking about the paul brothers 
Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No. Uh... Well, no, he's an introverted. He's the Paul brother's introverted stepbrother. But Rosedale, especially with this idea of beauty, I think it's a good thing you bring up because he is. Ex- I almost, I almost view Rosedale as like the male counterpart to Lily Bart. To some way, I mean, well, I guess we could make this argument here, where it's like he's struggling to cement himself in that class as well. Mm-hmm. And, you know, to get into any kind of like, oh, I'm going to try to get into this exclusive club, whatever it is, you know. We're, we're, that's a big theme, too. Us, New I money mean, versus old money. Well, yeah, I mean, and that's in all her work. Uh, what was I saying? Yeah, but Rosedale is like, I don't know, he, he's trying, and we all know how difficult that is, I mean, like, any type of elite thing you're trying to get into, like, uh, Sophie and I are struggling writers, I mean, to get into that field, I mean, that's an elite field, I mean, we, it's, it's not easy, I mean, it takes a lot of... It's thought of as an elite field? Well, I mean, it is, I mean, there are gatekeepers, I mean, there are, you know, you have to kind of earn your way, you have to kiss Unless the ring. Unless you're a poet. Yeah, well... Even then, I mean, you have to kiss the ring. You have to go to the right school. And if you didn't go to the right school, it's going to be more difficult for you. And if you don't have family wealth, it's going to be more difficult for you if you don't have... Anyway, I don't want to get off topic with that. But just like, yeah, Rosedale trying to cement himself into the class that so is Lily. And, you know, he faces a lot more obstacle than she does, too. Whereas she gets to have obstacle in the sense of, you know, she has her pick of, of several men throughout the story all that could do that for her like cement her into that top the top class like that a life of leisure that she's been trained for and then like but like you know rosedale's constantly rejected it's been you know over the course of the novel he's slowly accumulating what she wants well and he's not even just really rejected exclusively by women in a romantic nature it seems he's described as ugly yeah like he's not attractive. He's described as fat and ugly <laughs> and shiny. And red. And grotesque. Red, yeah. Like his skin's always like and flush also red. And he's as, like... I mean, he's also described as a Jewish man. <laughs> he, is the one, he is the one Jewish man in the novel. Here it is, dude. The anti-Semitism already. <laughs> Here it is. I mean, but it's a... It, I'm sure it was ever present, you know? Oh my <laughs> like, god, yeah, dude, this was... Can't get away from that. I'm... This early sentence from Selden, he had confused... He had a confused sense. Again, he always has a fucking confused sense in the same way that Lily always has a vague sense. (laughs) Selden, always confused. Lily, always vaguely aware. Um, But he had a confused sense that she must have cost a great deal to make, that a great many dull and ugly people must, in some mysterious way, have been sacrificed to produce her. He was aware that the qualities distinguishing her from the herd of her sex were chiefly external. Oh, good, man. So, like, even from the start, it's, like, wild that we can sort of follow and fall in love with the idea of Lawrence Selden and Lily falling in love. And this is, like, in my copy, this is page three. Um, So that comes in instantly. And so it's wild to me that we already are falling in love with the idea of Selden and Lily falling in love, even though we're so aware. Maybe we weren't aware when we were reading, but he's aware um, that what he, that part of, or what he appears to be aware that he is drawn to is chiefly external. He's chiefly external. Like everything he notices. No, I mean, he he's just talking about her beauty. Right, which is almost any man talks about when it comes to her. I guess, but her charm too, right? So, like, well, it's, it's stated frankly. It's right. stated really in a forthright way when she is abroad. And this comes beginning of book two, when. 
She is traveling with a group of friends who are not exactly friends anymore. Um, she's with the Dorsets on their yacht. And um, there's like talk of Lily. And one of the women says, don't you understand that it, like it's her beauty that does it because they're all bitching because I guess Lily is getting is finding her way into certain circles and maybe having a better time than the rest of them or I don't know they consider it unearned yeah well because she didn't like bite the bullet and do the marriage thing and suffer that right and because she and the rest of them did well because she has the power of her beauty like the the privilege the uh the idea that she's allowed to um she can use that tool that not everybody has uh, almost carelessly, recklessly even. And I mean, everybody resents that. We always resent attractive people. Of course. If we're being honest. And I mean, even that like she, I think it's even more that she so carelessly had every chance, right? There's the moment with Percy Grice um, where she sort of blows him off to hang out with Lawrence Selden. And because Bertha Dorset is wanting to hook up with Lawrence Selden because I guess they had some kind of affair a while back. And this is like when we're at Bellamont. This is pretty early on. You know, she starts talking shit about Lily to Percy Grace and he runs off. So that kind of gets spoiled for her, but she doesn't want it anyway. I mean, she literally refers to the idea of marrying him as doing, maybe doing her the honor of being bored for life or something. I've written down somewhere. Yeah. So she talks about his book collection. Yeah, yeah. his Americana collection. It's worse. But you've got me thinking, though, yeah, so, like, when they, like, Wharton shows us in the very first scene that that interaction with Lily and Selden, Lily and Selden have the best conversations. Like, when you're reading the book, like, the conversation between Lily and Selden are, like, the two, their wits, especially before uh, Lily quote-unquote kind of like gets passed like through all these different marriage proposals <laughs> essentially that she, before that even happens just like how she clearly wants us to see how how evenly matched they are like Selden doesn't have the wealth but he has the charm she finds him attractive in the right ways he has the intelligence to keep up with her like they can and talk. everyone else yeah. is just ugly right yeah <laughs> well, that too else. Is just disgusting. This kind right? of the concern for look, the concern. I mean, for what look. proposals does she get? She gets. I mean, without getting it, she almost gets Seldon's. She could have Seldon's. She got all of them, dude. She she. That's the thing is, yeah, she could have any of right, them. Right, but she it's knew it. not the one she gets because she doesn't try for it. She doesn't seek it. Right, she thinks they it's beneath consistently her. Consistently avoid specifically that because he knows that he can't satisfy her desire for um an atmosphere of wealth right and which is what and the book tells us she has been sort of brought up to be made for essentially it's all she knows and she won't do it because he can't satisfy her (laughs) desire for well, and she also knows it's not realistic for her that she could likely be miserable or believes she would be. Right, and and honestly, Selden believes it too. At least in yeah. the order, like he he understands that, so he doesn't be more assertive with her because he knows. Not only is he in a lower class of her currently, but like will never be able to ascend to that top one percent of one percent. Like all the new money that was flooding into New York. And going abroad, by the way, too. I know it's not in the book, but I mean, just historically, like, the American women that were, again, this is during an extremely sexist time, that were just, like, married off, Mm. you know, to British royal families, 
uh, my wife and I just watched a documentary about that actually, about like the American mm-hmm. princesses that were married off to like <clears throat> these like British families that are that were losing their wealth at the time, and like all this new money in America from like the huge industrial revolution and like the explosion of the railroads, et cetera, et cetera, all that kind of shit. They were basically just like, oh shit, we need to marry all these rich rich girls from America to like keep their family wealth from like evaporating. Yeah. It's funny as I'm watching Downton Abbey now that's like happening. That's like one of the like it's like <laughs> it's like a storyline in there now that I think about it. It keeps coming up in my head. It's really weird that we would when I, we read this book, reread it too. Like this is the second time you and I had read it in like a year, basically, uh, to do this this podcast episode. And it was just like uh I, I ended up watching like all these things about like wealthy aristocrats, like like fictional shows, like the same deal and i'm just like damn like this is all the same like it's all kind of the because but yeah that brings me to this next thing man we talked about the beauty how important it is but like this idea of uh wealth the aristocracy Mm -hmm. the concerns of of when you're that filthy rich how your concerns are uh laughable to us laughable to us peasants to some extent right like they have no real problems basically there aren't any like real problems that people face on a daily basis so it's like these stupid gossip things like i mean it's why everybody likes gossip girl but i wanted to ask like so we were talking about wealth why do we like wealthy why do we like to watch wealthy or see wealthy characters because there's a fuckload of them i mean we can go historically back into like okay you know well only wealthy people really wrote books but like because everybody was so impoverished and you know all the other shit that was happening but like even in modern times there's just like a why do we uh, everything set in like a wealthy i don't know it seems to me why do we care about this the same reason we want to peek in on kim kardashian's life right well that's an yeah. example of it right i mean why like they're so rich we want to know and we also want to see their dope furniture and their high ceilings or else we wouldn't watch the undoing featuring nicole kidman and hugh grant yeah and their and their townhouse in manhattan or whatever that they were yeah their brownstone uh, yeah they're like 12 million dollar townhouse yeah well, that's the thing, too, is I think about Kardashian. Some, like I said, I was thinking about Kardashian a lot with this book uh, when we were reading I it. I was not, so I'm kind of interested. Well, probably I was only thinking about it because, like, you know, my wife watches it all the time. So I watch it because she watches it. <laughs> so, like, you know, it's... Uh, so I see it more. And, like, it's not like I'm even, like, sitting there and be like, oh, let's watch this next episode. It's like it's just on and like I'm in the room doing whatever, like reading my book or whatever. Uh, and yeah, then like, man. I just see, so when, that I constantly see. When Bill see. puts on too hot to handle, I'm just sitting there reading, not watching it. I'm not yeah. invested. Yeah. <laughs> but even so, it. like I just see it. So then it's I my hear, favorite show right now. I hear like, you know, the, the what? Shut up. And then like the, the, like the, the, the fake drama that like is occurring. Like when it happens, like a glass gets broken or something, especially all like housewives, like all those shows. But yeah, I mean, the real housewives is another great example. Why? So we like to watch these uber rich ladies as opposed to like some middle class ladies or like some poor ladies, like just like going around their daily lives. Like, Well, so there's this, and this might not be answering our question. It might be really, really, really reaching. And it's another thing from the very beginning of the book that I was sort of hung up on. um, Where he's talking, we're talking about, she's still talking to Lawrence Selden. They're in his apartment. They're talking about how... um, basically what it means to be a marriageable woman in society um, and feeling sort of chained to a particular fate. And they're talking about Gertie Farish, 
uh, Lawrence Selden's poor cousin. And she says, I forgot she was your cousin, but we're so different, you know? She likes being good, and I like being happy. <laughs> yeah. God, that just makes, yeah. you love, makes you love Lily Bart, dude. It does. I mean, at least in these moments where she, like, this is when she's being very forthright. But they're also, this goes back to both, I guess, like, you know, wealth and beauty are intertwined to some extent. Like, like not always, but usually if you're, like, as beautiful as they want us to see think Lily is, um, we never actually get, like, a description like of like, we get like not really, sc- no. scattered descriptions, and I think they describe her hair more than anything else because she's constantly having to put it up and down and stuff, and like hats, whatever. Yeah, hats, maybe her jewelry. But um, like this when idea, when she's wearing a particular dress, they when she's like part of this exhibition thing. Um, yeah. They talk about her sort of outline. Yeah. But her this... lines and her curves. fact that she's aging so like the fact that you know that that it's also a limited amount of time that you get the beauty well yeah and that's so consistently important to mood like literally to the character's moods and to lilies in particular i guess but also to others i mean it seems like her background, whatever scenery she's sort of set against is very entangled in whatever she's feeling. That's the thing too, is if I, I, what I see a lot of the stuff said about this book is that, yeah, I mean, the caring about the aesthetic or at least like the, the superficial things, the environment. But I think, is it superficial? Like, I guess that's maybe one of the questions that I'm asking. And I think, I guess, that they're asking, too, you know, are the things that offer you comfort or joy superficial? Does that... Some, I mean, yeah, I mean, they can be. And what is the value of beauty, you know? Yeah, I think it can be superficial, but it's like, uh, yeah, I I think you could still get pleasure out of those superficial things, too, but... Of course you do, I mean... But I guess what I'm asking is, is a love of being in sort of a constantly set against a beautiful background. Is that superficial? Specifically? No, because... Or in Edith Wharton's mind, is it? Of course not. I don't... I don't think so. Or even in the characters, when the characters constantly talking about the 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 surroundings. I mean, that scene with the dad with. Uh... It's not even just the characters; it's the narrator. Right. It feels like. I mean, well, I guess the narrator giving us Lily's view very often, but really uh-huh. through everyone, it's so permeates everything. Everybody hates a drab drawing room. Nobody wants to walk yeah, into that like. Or poorly upholstered furniture. Yeah. There's a lot of that, too, dude. I mean, yeah. So I guess I guess that idea of taste. But more so, like, the superficial pleasure of seeing something that's just beautiful. I mean, I think we do like to see it, even if it was natural, right? I mean, the standards of beauty are still kind of the same. If we were looking at, like, a, an undisturbed, you know, natural landscape, and most people would call that beautiful. And, like, if you're in that setting it does have like a tangible effect on like mood like you said mood uh atmosphere judgment like when you're in like a museum and everything feels like you can't touch it i mean not just because they have like signs on it but like you know everything feels grand and white 
and like like marble everywhere you just like feel like you should like watch where you step because you're gonna leave a footprint on the shine yeah but it feels like i mean it's the it's the same thing in the in the novel you know that's what they all want that's what success is okay that's good dude we should get to that success because there is that idea she and selden have that conversation about success like what they view success which one i feel like Um, oh yeah i want to say it is chapter six book one okay i think my chapter six and seven are a little bit weird oh wait no that's in book two i think success she hesitated why to get as much as one can out of life i suppose it's a relative quality after all is not that your idea of it? Yeah. My <laughs> idea of it? God forbid. He sat up with sudden energy, resting his elbows on his knees and staring out upon the mellow fields. My idea of success, he said, is personal freedom. Freedom? Yeah. Freedom from worries. From everything. So like they have that whole exchange about like yeah. what they view success. This is the Republic of the Spirit. The Republic of the Spirit. That's what I call success. That's what Selden says. And then, and this is the crazy thing, because this is like one of the things I noticed Republic of the Spirit. Wharton can do. This is one of the incredible things that I feel like Wharton can do in a way that convinces me is when a character in conversation takes a serious emotional turn like it's just it becomes tonally different after he says that like they go from this sort of game of wits to like her saying and so she leaned forward with a responsive flash i know i know it's strange but that's just what i've been feeling today and so she gets like really intense here is the feeling so rare with you yeah and then she's embarrassed yeah this is one of uh, yeah. This is one of my favorite scenes. I mean, this is right. This is when they're at Bellamont. Yeah, dude. I mean, and they have their chat at Bellamont because, and she's blowing off going to church with Percy Grace. Right. Or she has just blown him off. Yeah, but she did it like accidentally on purpose. Like, didn't she do it on purpose? But then she was like, "Oh, I feel terribly unwell. I woke up late, and oh, is that you, Lawrence, in the library?" Yeah. Oh, have I missed the carriage? And meanwhile, she, like, knows that she's missed the carriage. Yeah. You know? And she's, like, really happy to have missed the carriage. She's like, oh, well, I'll just go walk after it to appear to have tried. Uh, That's why we love Lily Bart. (laughs) You know? and But it's just, like, yeah, it's so at once a little bit obnoxious. And so is the thing that makes you fall in love with her. But if so, yeah, I mean, in Lilia Bart's idea of to success being to get as much as one can out of life. And I guess that I mean, that's vague enough to mean anything. So to get as much as one can, I mean, of everything, I suppose. Yeah. And it's also the language she chooses get to get <laughs> as a verb. So she's like passive in this. Right. She's like, well, I want to receive as much as I can in my life. Please shower me. Please shower me with gifts and love life. So, like, we don't really read it that way, but it's, like, the word she chose that it's, like, yeah. I, would I, I mean, this is what I relate to the most with Lee Bart is just the, the not being satisfied. Uh, yeah. Kind of no matter what you get, there's, like, uh, you're never really satisfied with it. I mean, this goes from, like, a creation standpoint to, like, writing, etc. But, like, yeah, I mean, just never being... I think of that fucking Hamilton song Well, it's song like now. every option is either risky or outright repulsive. That's what it feels like. Yeah, but either way, like, you just wouldn't be satisfied with it. I mean, that you could... I, and this is not to get off topic, but this is even, like, a theme in most of... Wharton's novels, most of her characters uh, have some degree of this, like, oh, you have everything you could ever ask for, and it's not enough. Like, 
Well, right, and we learned that, you know, early on <laughs> when they're, you know, this is still during their conversation at, at Belmont. She, he's talking about, you know, finding one's way into the Republic of the Spirit, which is, I guess, to not be utterly reliant on, like, your rich friend's material wealth or, I guess, your own in some cases. He tells her that she won't be allowed into the Republic. She says, why not? Is it a celibate order? And he says, not in the least, though I'm bound to say there are not many married people in it. (sighs) But you will marry someone very rich, and it's as hard for rich people to get into as the kingdom of heaven. The sex, the sex playfulness right there. The, <clears throat> the flirtation, I didn't even pick up on it first. Yeah. Is it celibate? No, just to move us on, we talked all those themes. I was thinking uh, we talked love versus marriage now. We move on. Mm-hmm. And I was thinking specifically of the scene, I think it is at Belmont, where... Uh, Selden and Lily admit that they love each other like to one another in like one of their like witty interactions and it's like kind of tragic it's kind of sad like it's uh almost like uh uh no this isn't a villain about this is when um she got uh screwed it's chapter chapter 12 book one towards the end of it she basically gets her first like ostracizing from like that class. Yeah. Yeah, I know exactly where yeah. you are. I think so it's, it's after uh, Julia is told of Lily's uh, uh, money that Trenner gave her because mm-hmm. he was trying to bang her. They wouldn't like leave his wife for her, so that was on the table for her too. Suddenly she raised her eyes with the beseeching earnestness of a child. You never speak to me. You think hard things of me, she murmured. I think of you at any rate, God knows, he said. Then why do we never see each other? Why can't we be friends? You promised once to help me. Uh, She continued in the same tone, blah, 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 uh, as though words were drawn from her unwillingly. And then uh, Selden, the only way I can help you is by loving you, Selden said in a low voice. She made no reply, but her face turned to him with the soft motion of a flower. His own met it slowly, and their lips touched. She drew back and rose from her seat. Selden rose too, and blah, blah, blah. And then, then she, uh, suddenly she caught his hand and pressed it, a, mo- uh, pressed it a, a moment against her cheek. Ah, love me, love me, but don't tell me so. She sighed with her eyes in this. Like, that's, that's like the moment where they basically tell each other yeah. that they love each other. And then she bounces. She just turns away. Right. Before he could speak, she had turned and slipped through the arch of the bo- of boughs. And he just sort of stands there. Yeah. He knew too well the transiency of exquisite moments to attempt to follow her. Yeah. Like, they just, like, told each other they love each other. And that he would make her problems go away, even though they wouldn't be rich. Yeah, dude, it's a crazy way (laughs) to basically, I mean, isn't that basically, where is that in relation to the end of book two, or of book one? Um, It's literally just chapter 12, so it's like three, three, four chapters, uh, three chapters before the end. Book one. So it's like in the middle of the book. That's basically just the middle of the book right. is that scene. Well, that's, I mean, that's the tragedy, right? I mean, when they actually admit that they love each other, and we already knew that they did from that first chapter. I mean, where they're talking about all the, like, the other people and Lily's future, etc. Oh, they just straight up admit it to each other. Like, they just straight up say it. And they still do nothing about it. They both just, like, kind of let that pass. Like, that's the tragedy. Like, that's, like I said, something out of Shakespeare right there. She presses his hand to her cheek. She's like, I love me, love me, but do not say so, right? Fucking Shakespearean. Has anybody made a movie Uh, out of this? I guess we should have looked that up before we... I think so. (laughs) I guess we we should have looked that up before we fucking... Yeah, we should probably watch that. Damn, dude, it'd be interesting to watch. We'll we'll do that as like a Patreon. Subscribe to our fucking Patreon, and we'll do that. We'll do like a 
reading and then a watching and compare. But only if you pay us, bitch. Uh, <laughs> and then I have all these notes on satire, which I don't even feel like getting into. No. Uh, There's the thing about what society actually is. Um, and there are lots of images of and sort of descriptions of this throughout, I think. Um, early on, see, it's page 39 for me. Society is a revolving body which is apt to be judged according to its place in each man's heaven. And at present, it was turning its illuminated face to Lily. I mean, it just seems like there's a constant theme of society as something that moves like a current or revolves. You just kind of wade into it and let it take you. Yeah. Right. Um, and you're just sort of subject to it. And it's a lot about chance and fate over choice. Or at least sort of as compared with choice, maybe not as opposed to it instead of. Yeah. I have written down about uh, how she doesn't want to take refuge in Selden's love. Mm -hmm. Like, even though he offers it to her, like, we went over the first, like, several times. And I guess this ends book one. Where, uh, I think I know what you're talking about. Yeah, that's what she. Uh, it's after she tells her uh, her aunt about her debts and stuff like that, and the aunt is like all pissed and like telling her she's like a you know, you failed us, etc. You know, mm-hmm. like Grace had stepped me and like, uh, <clears throat> or or whoever it was told her all that, uh, all the rumors to Aunt Julia. To paint uh, Lily in a bad light. Yep. But on, it's on page one seventy three of the Penguin edition. But it's uh, right before the like end of book one here. Yeah. Chapter. And she had felt even in the full storm of her misery that Selden's love could not be her ultimate refuge. Only it would be so sweet to take a moment's shelter there while she gathered fresh strength to go on. Right. But now his love was her only hope. Is the next line. Right. And then she goes back to the river's flow. As seductive as the river's flow to the suicide. Yeah, just another example of her just admitting. And that's when she's talking to Gertie, which is also, I think, when we find out maybe or around where we find out that Gertie also loves Selden a little weird because they're cousins but it was cool back then that gets into the idea of sacrifice or at least the theme of sacrifice to some extent with this um I was thinking a little bit about this after you and I were texting back and forth like the idea that one must be willing to sacrifice in order to get where one wants and I'm thinking more along kind of like the second half of the book where she's contemplating marrying Rosedale and like honestly talking about that being like a sacrifice she might be willing to take, make to like get there. Uh, And then the kind of like the costs cause like of going after. So she's the fact that Lily, what we're reading about really is the cost of trying to put yourself into that world. Yeah. And how, you know, only when it's really bad, only when it's at its worst, does that become an appealing option. Yeah, like, and even Rosedale, I mean, later on he talks about it when he sees her down on her luck, like the idea of, like, what has to be sacrificed to obtain it. I don't know. It's an interesting idea. I wanted to talk about it. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting you bring that up, too, because of her charity moment. You know, charity when, when she decides on a whim to give money she got from Rosedale, which is really the thing that starts her downfall, right? She has this debt that she owes to, or to Trenner, to Gus Trenner, and that sort of puts her at her worst. And um, 
But before that, what like, she um, gets all of that money from him, and she decides to give some of it to charity, and she just feels so virtuous. Oh yeah. And she feels like, in that moment, she really understands something about the nature of life or something. And then at the end, she's like, "Oh, I didn't understand shit about living in squalor or like what it meant." to just sort of do the things of human life, which is sort of the language that she puts it in, is how she's essentially been absent from life. Well, it's just not been her concern. It's not been the concern. Yeah. I was thinking, like, because Gertie, Gertie is the character that she's always kind of honest with. And cause, just because she's so earnest, I guess. Yeah. And, like, when she's telling Gertie, she's completely... Um, She's finished, basically, after Bertha Dorset had, like, uh, said all those things about her. Fucking Bertha Dorset. Yeah. Is this, um... It's the what is truth, like, monologue. After... Is this at the... for the end? Uh, it's page 226 in mine, but yeah. it's chapter four of book two, where she's just talking to Gertie, and she's like... What is truth? Where a woman is concerned, it's the story that's easiest to believe. In this case, it's a great deal easier to believe Bertha Dorset's story than mine, because she has a big house and an opera box, and it's convenient to be on good terms with her. God damn. You asked me, and a little bit further down, you asked me, you asked me just now for the truth. Well, the truth about any girl is that once she's talked about, she's done for. And the more she explains her case, the worse it looks. My good Gertie, you don't happen to have a cigarette, do you? Yeah. <laughs> oh. Oh. Yeah. That's good. Bertha fucking Dorset, dude. She's such a bitch. Yeah. Well, because she wanted to fuck Lawrence Selden. I mean, this is, uh. happens all the time. I mean, I guess not that extreme. I mean, should we talk about the end? What happens? Of course. Like her decline? The ultimate decline of Lily Bart. So, I mean, and at this point, she has sort of taken a job. She, she's been disinherited, so she's only getting a little bit of money from her aunt. It's only going to basically pay back her debt to Gus Trenner, which she only has because she believed it to be... She also, like, believed him to be um, speculating on Wall Street using her own money, but he was actually just giving it to her, I guess. <laughs> he was trying to bang her, dude. He was, yeah, yeah, he was just trying to fuck. And he's trying to get her, Such was get rid of his the wife. the transactional nature of living in this part of society. Gurdon, Gertie is, like, being the most honest, especially in book two, when Gertie kind of starts to lay down... She has a big, like, soliloquy kind of, again, very Shakespeare-esque, like, where she has this big, like, kind of, like, monologue she gives um, uh, when she's talking with Selden about Lily, telling him to go see her, or that uh, she needs help again. This is, like, like the fourth or fifth time like, she's, like, telling Selden that, like, Lily needs help. Or she's, like, uh, telling him to, like, do something to help her and she's like I do ask you then I ask you because she once told me that you had been a help to her and because she needs help now she has never needed it before you know how dependent she has always been on ease and luxury how she has hated what was shabby and ugly and uncomfortable she can't help it she was brought up with those ideas and has never been able to find her way out of them but now all the things she cared for have been taken from her and the people who taught her to care for them have abandoned her too and it seems to me that if someone could reach out a hand and show her the other side, show her how much is left in life and in herself, Gertie broke off. Like, she couldn't even finish it. Like, kind of like Gertie, I just said, like, Gertie right there is laying out the entire story of the book. Like, right in that. Yeah. Like, Lily was raised to get these things. She kind of fails at getting them. And Gertie is, like, the honest one desperately trying to tell her that, look, there's so much more but it doesn't matter. And uh, she can't get through to her. She's like, oh, but it's not her fault. 
And then this is when she turns, like, Lily has turned toward bitterness, which is why Gertie is so upset. I was going to ask you, like, when do we think Lily turns toward bitterness? Like, re more resentful of the fact that she's officially kind of, like, rejected from all of this. Like, the world of the elite of the elite. I mean, I guess when she returns from her trip, right? But, I mean, the biggest moment, I would say, is, like, when she's disinherited. I would say disinherited and then my what i wrote down here in my notes was when rosedale rejects her i mean that was like really the the darkest yeah. moment when she's finally come to terms with it and she's like okay i'll marry you and he's like mm, that doesn't still stand it's been like a while it's, since yeah, i it's been like a year you know. and you don't <laughs> offer the same benefit you like disappeared like you like went on a trip for a while and didn't say anything i don't know and, like, all of these rumors have happened since then. George Dorset's been trying to, like, get down with you for a while now, and everyone knows it. Even his wife. Which is why she brought you anyway. It seems by the time she has to get a job, she is just over. Like, she's just sort of checked out. Well, that solidifies it, yeah. Have, but I would say before we get there, I mean, with this idea of the, the turn. So like, you know, every great novel has, you know, the character turn. I mean, Lily's kind of happy go lucky slowly fades and slowly fades. But then it like really takes that turn towards like resentment and bitterness. And <clears throat> it's not entirely clear. She does mention like her mother once or twice. I mean, not even her mentioning it, but it's just in the narration her like thinking about her mother and like all the stuff she told her you know raised her to seek these these you know things out yeah i mean at the end it's just um well i mean throughout the novel she kind of refers to the part of society she's hanging out in as like this great guilt cage and one of the reasons why she's attracted to Lawrence Selden is because he's the only one in it who's found his way out. It actually gets solidified really towards the end when she's hearing. I thought it was uh, interested to hear what you think. So. She's drugged up as fuck. No, uh, when she's in the hat shop still. So like a week before yeah. all that where she's like trying to put these goddamn things on the hat and then... Uh, Mm -hmm. she's hearing all the talk of the other women and they're all talking about like the people that she used to run with. Like they're talking about who's buying this hat that they're making for it. They're like, you know, Mrs. Dorset is like coming to get this this afternoon, blah, blah. blah. And like, uh, for listeners that don't know too, although if you've made it this far, you're probably a diehard lit fan and you might know this, which like, uh, before we had movie stars and shit like that, like we just wrote about rich people, and so like they would just write about rich people what they wore in the paper and stuff. So they would just be like, oh, well, you know, Lily Bart wore this gown designed by you know blah blah blah. And here's where she's going for the weekend. Yeah. She is one of the people getting on this boat right. that's going here. Yeah. Oh God! When she's still with Miss, she's still with Miss Hatch at this point, or is she in the boarding it's, house? It's uh, she's about to uh, go to uh, I think she's done with Miss Hatch. She's in the boarding house, but it's page two eighty five with mine. I don't see the chapter here. Well, that's gonna be earlier. It's chapter nine in book two. Is this after she has? Oh, the never run mind. In? It's chapter ten, book two. She's in like the hat, making the hats. And anyway, she just hears them all talking about, like, all the people they write about in the papers. So, like, all the uh, the rich people that Lily used to work or, you know, hang around, play bridge with, all that kind of stuff. And then Lily's, like, the narration just goes after she hears them, like, kind of, like, the murmuring around the table as they all work on these hats for who they're for, right? Uh, and Lily is in her head, on and on it flowed, a current of meaningless sound. On which, startling enough, starting, startlingly enough, a familiar name now and then floated to the surface. It was the strangest part of Lily's strange experience. The hearing of these names, the seeing the fragmentary and distorted image of the world she had lived in, reflected in. 
reflected in the mirror of working girls' minds. She had never before suspected the mixture of insatiable curiosity and contemptuous freedom with which she and her kind were discussed in this underworld of toilers who lived on their vanity and self-indulgence. Yep. And it's like this, like, I mean, the moment of realization for Lily right there of just, like, she used to be the people that the girls talked about, and now she's sitting with the girls and hearing them talk about people that, like, don't like her, and I've, like, kicked her out, made sure, and all that stuff, you know? Yeah, I mean, well, and she says, you know, how distant those days seemed, essentially. When she had visited the girls' club with Gertie Ferris, she had felt an enlightened an enlightened interest in the working classes. But that was because she looked down on them from above, from the happy altitude of her grace and her benef- beneficence. Beneficent? Benef- benefits? <laughs> Yeah, dude, there's a lot of big words in this fucking book. Oh, but... <laughs> bad when it's... <laughs> it's bad when it's broken across a line, too. Yeah. Beneficence. Jesus Christ. Now that she was on a level with them, the point of view was less interesting. God, yeah. All right. So she has that moment. It's fucking great. Now we need to talk about the death, dude. I'm in the death of a lady uh, the drugs you know yeah the drugs talk about the drugs she she gets into you know a little a little opiate (laughs) as one does i mean you know she has this hate love relationship with tea and caffeine generally she can't sleep she is essentially fired from her job (laughs) Oh, yeah, dude. Um, Because she kind of sucks because then there's generally some, like, hesitance to to have hired her anyway because she's a pretty lady who, like, hung out with rich people and not someone who was trained in any way. So she was, like, playing catch-up and she wasn't really an effective decorator of hats. So she starts getting this prescription that was a copy of the prescription that she, I guess, learned of from Norma Hatch when she was working for her as a secretary. And, you know, she takes it every night. She just takes a few drops, whatever. Uh, But, you know, it's an opiate. You got to increase the dose. It, like, gets less effective. We learned pretty early on that, like, it's really easy to overdose on. And then, um, well, she has this run-in with one of the girls from Gertie's charity who has now married George Dorset, um, who divorced his wife. Right? And she has a baby. Uh. And Lily go like, you know, this woman comes up on Lily who's like sitting around, I, I think like on a bench or something because she's just fucking tired and she doesn't want to go back to her boarding house yeah. because it's fucking ugly. It sounds like she's strung out yeah. on opiates, what it sounds like. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, yeah, but she isn't because she can't fucking sleep. So she goes, she's like, fuck it. Like, I shouldn't have tea, but I'm going to hang out here. And she gets this whole story about how, you know, often this girl thinks of her and blah, blah, blah. You know, you really turned my life around. And um, she has this moment where she holds the baby. And she talks about, she. I guess it's sort of supposed to be comforting the way it's described. Where she gets that old woman she did is Nettie Struther, right? And Nettie Strother. And uh, it was Nettie Crane when she gave her the money. But yeah, and then she goes there and sees basically it's the first time she's ever hung out with poor people in her life. <clears throat> like, gone over their house. But she, like, kind of thinks it's nice there. Right. Like, she's not bothered by she's it. Like it's warm by the fire. Oh, yeah, here it is. The child's confidence in its safety thrilled her with a sense of warmth and returning life, and she bent over, wondering what rosy blur of the little face, the empty clearness of the eyes. 
vague tenderly motions of the folding and unfolding fingers. At first, the burden in her arms seemed as light as a pink cloud or a heap of down, but as she continued to hold it, the weight increased, sinking deeper and then penetrating her with a strange sense of weakness, as though the child had entered into her and became a part of herself. So now I guess we can talk about her death. Yeah. That moment's really important to talk about her death, right? So I guess this baby sort of makes something, it sort of invigorates her and gives her a sense of comfort and security. I put it as, uh, right around that same area in that same chapter, I put it as like acceptance, where she does reach this level of acceptance when she goes back to her boarding house after she leaves the tenement house that she just went in. <clears throat> where she goes uh, it was not till she entered her own door that she felt the reaction of a deeper loneliness it was long after seven o'clock and the light and odors proceeding from the basement made it manifest that the boarding house dinner had begun she hastened up to her room lit the gas and began to dress she did not mean to pamper herself any longer to go without food because her surroundings made it unpalatable since it was her fate to live in a boarding house she must learn to fall in with the conditions of the life Nevertheless, she was glad that, when she descended to the heat and glare of the dining room, the repast was nearly over. And then we don't, yeah, I guess we could talk about whether she's lying about that or not, because, you know, she goes and then after that she starts like laying out all her dresses that she still owns. Yeah, she sort of starts taking stock of everything. Right. Well, it's, maybe it's is this kind of false sense of acceptance, but that sense of acceptance is what allows her to take a few more drops as well. Yeah. Because right after that, she gets that check. Yeah, so she gets that check. She sort of is getting, like, those affairs in order, right? Yeah. She, like, addresses one to her bank, one envelope to her bank, and one to Trenner has like essentially paid her debt yeah with like nothing but a few dollars left over and she takes she and she's thinking she's laying in bed and she is certain that she's like holding this baby oh i mean that's that's the best i mean that's wharton basically showing what a master of the craft she is i think <clears throat> that scene where she feels the baby in her arm and that's what yep. her death is she feels the baby like she thinks she's holding that baby so i guess you could say it's kind of beautiful in that sense that she has this last moment of comfort even though it's not real that uh you could almost say superficial we take it all the way back to the beginning yeah. so it's almost this superficial level of comfort uh and she, that just ends with her falling asleep, you know, and in her mind, she's certain she's holding this baby. Right. And then the next, the, the last um, chapter we get from Gertie and Lawrence. God, that last and chapter, man. Lawrence mm. only is there because he is on her way to tell her and this is the thing that she was thinking right before she falls asleep that there was some word some word she could say to make everything that had passed between them um clear and it the next chapter begins with lawrence and this like he, oh god he goes there and he's like I have to speak to her and then he finds a bunch of people there and he's like what's up and she's dead and it sort of ends with um you know this word had passed between them and it made everything clear god it's such a heartbreaker it's so heartbreaking and no we don't learn the word yeah Wait a second, we'll talk about that in a minute. I'll just be like, what do we think that word is? <laughs> but uh, it's still... It's the farts, dude. The farts. <laughs> it's a little gas, that's all it is. It's just gas passing. God, yeah, when he sees it, just because the tragic... I mean, this is what... <clears throat> she has this kind of theme in all of her work, but this 
this tragedy, this, I don't know, I guess like I would call it like a fear of love or, uh, but I mean, it really is just kind of like a tragic aspect. Because everything's about appearances also. And he's also hung up on, like, every time someone mentions, you know, the shit with Trenner or some other bullshit, every time he hears the gossip, he gets kind of enraged. And it's not because he wants to stand up for her, like he kind of does, but it's because he um, is like, dude, fuck that. Like, why are you hanging out with these people? They suck. Except he also kind of hangs out with them. <laughs> they suck, but you want to be them. Or at least yeah, so... be in that world that they have. Like he says, freedom. Well, what is freedom? Freedom from money. Well, really the only way you have freedom from money is by having a fuckload of it. <laughs> I mean, like, I guess you could technically go like the end of the wild route or whatever. But usually you're not. That's not, I don't think what he's talking about. He's talking about the leisure to, like, write a book or something. All the stuff the upper classes did for, you know, centuries. Still do, I guess. Yeah, well, and he has his own biases. He, like, doesn't... He's specifically chosen to not pursue a married life. For the most part. Yeah, or did he choose that, or he did it because he just loves Lily? Hard to know, but he presents it as though it's like he's chosen to avoid this particular part of society. Mm -hmm. Even though he's frequently in it. God. But the tragedy... So it's just like super tragic. Yeah. Well, that's... I mean, that's what I mean to go back to the... I keep making this comparison to like Shakespeare, but this idea of love that is forbidden by whatever circumstances i mean you know they even in like romeo and juliet the love is forbidden by like stupid superficial shit you know some fucking rivalry yeah. between families like something that doesn't actually matter something we laugh at today but like there would like... well the same is true of edith wharton right well that's what i mean the same thing for this like yeah. lily and selden loved each other but it was this idea of, of it was forbidden not necessarily for any good reason but for this stupid superficial reason that's just like uh, well they're in different classes yeah I mean and it's not even that with the like right the problem in this one is that they're in the same class right that neither of them is rich And while they love each other, he cannot provide her the things that will make her the happiest. Or at least that's what she believes. Yeah, that's what they both believe, which is kind of strange. Like they both kind of believe that about... She believes it about him, and then he kind of believes it about himself. She believes it about herself, too. Right. So then what would be the word that you think passed that they couldn't say... Dude, I don't know. I guess you could say love, but like, they do kind of mention Fucking it. I do. Yeah, well, yeah, I don't know. They always say the thing about writing, too, is our literature is, you know, what's left unsaid is important, too. So, like, what, uh, and, you know, not that, I think that falls pretty, pretty, uh, pretty damn important for most of these characters here, too. Like, what's omitted and what is exaggerated and talked about. You know, I mean, how you can make anybody look any way you want if you just kind of say it in the right way, leave out the right things. I, I think the tragic thing was that there isn't a word. There was no word. Like, there was actually no word passed between them or that could pass between them that made it, the whole thing clear. Huh. That it was forever sort of not quite lived out or said that's definitely a, a more satisfying more satisfying way of thinking about it 
I mean, it's the way I have to think about it because I can't fucking think of a word. That, and I think the mystery does add something to that final ending. I mean, when you're talking about ending a massive work. We're not allowed to know. Right, or even just like if we did know that it wouldn't have been as tragic. But neither of them knew either. Like, Lily explicitly didn't know. She was like, there was some word, some word that would make it clear, but she couldn't think of it. She couldn't remember it. And she was like, sort of freaking out as she was falling asleep. Right, and it's always on the tip of your tongue, but you can't say it or you don't know it. Man. Lily Bart. Lily, Lily fucking Bart. Yeah, dude, Lily Bart holding that goddamn baby as she dies. Sad as shit. Uh, it's such... It's funny because that part's sad, but I think the real sad part is when, you know, she chooses to show us Selden finding her. Yeah. That's when it's real sad. Yeah. When he's like, God, I have to go see her. I must see her. I still actually love her. And then Gertie, like, leaves him alone. Yep. And he's just like, what are and you talking about? And so, like, about? she knows. Yeah, she's like, everybody knows. Everybody knew. Ugh. But they didn't, like... Even though they kind of did too, like they do admit it to each other at that one scene at the at the house, the Bellamont. They run away from it. Yeah, exactly. Like it's this fear of this uh, of of what they know, fear of love. This, uh, or maybe it's fear of what they do know. Maybe it's this fear of knowing that yeah they'll love each other, but like you know, they'll have this lower I don't know lower class existence that like. Yeah, and also their individual views of what marriage is and does. Right, and like the views of success, etc. As much as they overlap, where she's like, well, it's to have as much as one can get. It's like, well, that's freedom. And then if he's saying just to have freedom to do whatever he wants, or not even do whatever he wants, would, you know, do all the things that he wants to do, like accomplish and have time for, etc., etc. You know, what everybody fucking wants, like, do you know, the freedom. So they're not totally incompatible where like, they're both like these ideas of like being free to, uh, but I guess at the same time, like they're, they're not, they are incompatible. No. And she essentially says that. Yeah, dude, it's sad as shit. It's a sad one. Yeah. And Which I'll say, you know, she tends to be, it tends to be sad. Yeah. She writes tragedies. House of farts. House of Hot, House of Hot Firth, Forth, Fort. Yeah, and you know, I, uh, I think we like Lily. I'll say that too. Yeah, I definitely like Lily. I, I don't think we'll agree about this with every Edith Wharton novel we read about how likable the character is. Because Undine Sprague <laughs> and Custom of the Country is a bitch. Yeah, but I like Undie, too. I find her a little bit intolerable. Uh, yeah, it's a good book. I guess it's one that I feel like everyone should read. Feel better having read it. A little less ashamed and a little less bored. Yeah, it was definitely it was definitely better the second time. So I mean, I imagine the third time it would be better then too. So we just. It's, I mean, I guess this, I mean, this is why it's fucking canonized in the way it is. I mean, yeah, dude. We'll put the link in this. We'll put the link in the description for this if you guys buy copies of it to add to your library. That's a must own. All right, are we doing anything else with this? Um, I don't know. I feel like. You could, um, we might want to chop this up a bit. <laughs> All right. Well, nothing else about mirth. Well, Lily Bart. All right. If y'all want to contact us, our email is heavyboardpodcast at gmail.com. Uh, subscribe to our Patreon for full uncensored episodes for subscribers. Also exclusive interviews and content we're going to post there. Check out our YouTube channel. 
uh, for more. We're going to post clips of this up there as well. And obviously there's links to uh, all the books that we talk about and uh, the scholarship in the description of this. So next week or uh, next episode, we're going to be doing Bloom's The Art of Reading Poetry. We'll put a link down there to that as well. It's a short read. It's a short read and we hope we can we can get pretty in depth about it. Uh, I guess we'll t- we'll do that too. So if we'll like tell everybody next, I guess we'll talk about it more next week. But like, oof. we'll have to ask the audience if they would want us to go through Bloom's whole the best poetry of the American of English language. Yeah, because that's long. Because we'd have to do it in sections. But like, since we're doing the introductory essay, it could be like we'll ask people if they want us to do the whole thing, and we can go through it. We could do like a few. <laughs> Every so often, we can do like a chunk of it every. Right. Well, be, well, every he, other. he organizes it by time period, so we could just do time period. I think would be the easiest. You know, he literally just goes for chronological order, like. Yeah. So, anyway, we'll talk about that more next week. But all right, guys, this has been Heavy Board. I'm Andrew Whitstep. And I'm Sophie yep. Wiener. And we'll see you next time. See ya. Heavy. Bored. Heavy. I am heavy, heavy, heavy. Bored. Sweats and the day sweats, pal. Pal, I do.